Good evening, everyone. I'm David Selberg, CEO of Hospice of Santa Barbara. We have this evening almost a thousand folks participating tonight from all across the world, from faraway places uh, such as Argentina all the way to Zimbabwe. So thank you all for being with us. And a very special thank you to our lead sponsors, the Natalie Orfila Foundation and Lou Buglioli, the Ridley Tree Cancer Center, and the Santa Barbara Foundation. All are sponsoring our entire Illuminate Speakers series. And now I'll introduce both my friend and colleague at Hospice of Santa Barbara, Charles Caldwell. Charles? Hi there, David. Good to be here this evening. I'm really looking forward to hearing Dr. Puri's talk tonight. It should be very uh, illuminating, if you will. As many of you know, Hospice of Santa Barbara is a local nonprofit that has been serving families coping with grief or life-threatening illness for the past 47 years. Our motto is compassionate care freely given. And this reflects that all our services are offered completely free to the community. It's 100% supported through community donations. During this pandemic, we created the Illuminate Speaker Series as a free offering to address the widespread anxiety and stress and struggle people were experiencing. It's only made possible through your support. If you would like to ensure the future of this series or feel particularly inspired uh, this evening, please consider making a gift today by visiting our website. Thank you so much. And David, back to you now. Thank you, Charles. And now I have the pleasure to introduce our special guest speaker this evening, Dr. Sunita Puri. Dr. Puri is the medical director of palliative medicine at Keck Hospital and Norris Cancer Center at USC, where she also serves as chair of the ethics committee. Sunita's writings have appeared in the New York Times and the Journal of the American Medical Association. Her first book published in 2019, That Good Night, recounts the patient stories Sunita experienced in medicine, intertwining them with childhood memories and the importance of finding a common language to address illness and suffering. So without further ado, we present to you, Dr. Sunita Puri. Sunita? Hi, everybody. It's so good to be with you, and um, especially to hear that there's so many people here wanting to hear about this topic, which is a difficult one, but one that is so crucial in the times we live in. Um, I want to just let you guys know, I live with three very vocal animals. So I have two cats and a dog. And if you hear them in the background, hopefully they won't be too much of a distraction or an interruption. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. So my talk tonight is called Finding the Right Words for the Right Conversations. And I'm really grateful to Hospice of Santa Barbara for allowing me to be a part of this incredible speaker series. Um, several of my mentors have participated in this speaker series, so I'm especially humbled to be here today. My hope tonight is to talk with you about what I have seen and learned over the past year practicing palliative medicine as the COVID pandemic raged around us. As a writer and a physician, I have always believed that paying close attention to how we speak to each other can transform medicine and the doctor-patient relationship. Over the past year, I'd hoped the same would be true of conversations between family members, children, partners, parents, and siblings about what each of us would want if we too fell ill with COVID and potentially needed life support, CPR. I didn't anticipate how the loneliness, isolation, and separation from loved ones in the hospital would challenge my beliefs about communication and the humanity inherent in it in new ways. I'm here tonight to share with you what it's been like to care for innumerably sick people 
separated from their families, and how we might reframe conversations with the people we love as a radical act of deep love. So I actually start, wanted to start with a reading from my book, which was my future self writing to myself in the book as a palliative care fellow and writing about what the practice of palliative medicine can mean. It will eventually become second nature to sit with a patient you barely know and help them to understand that they are nearing the end of their lives. You tell yourself to push aside the awkwardness of essentially being a stranger to them and talk to them as if you do know them. You are forced to a place of extreme intimacy, talking to them about the lives they led up to this point, their fears and regrets, the people they love, the ways they have made sense of loss earlier in their lives and how they are making sense of loss now in the days or weeks or months they have left to live. You must act as if it is normal for a doctor to ask these probing questions during the first or second meeting with them. Because if you act awkward, they will wonder why you're here, why you are asking about their pain and shortness of breath, about who makes their medical decisions if they no longer can, about what they hope for and whether these hopes are realistic. You remind yourself to listen to them carefully to choose your words carefully, because one day you will be on the other side of this conversation and you will long for someone to listen to you and choose their words carefully. They will tell you how humiliating it is to have gone through innumerable surgeries and rounds of chemotherapy, only to be more familiar with their doctor's hands than their lover's hands. They tell you that because of their feeding tube, they haven't tasted real food in more than three years. They tell you that in three months, they plan to move to Oklahoma to be near their son. You wonder aloud if they have considered going sooner while trying to figure out how to tell them that three months, maybe even three weeks is wishful thinking. They tell you it isn't fair what's happening to them, that their spouse doesn't deserve to be alone they wipe their t-shirt, their tears on t-shirts that say fight on or miracle or fuck cancer. They show you photos on their phones of themselves with their families on the beach, in the park, at a parade, in a cafe. And you sometimes have to blink back tears because you know what they are trying to say. This is the real me. I'm going to be the real me again and you fear that cancer will claim their old and new selves, perhaps before the month is over. They wonder if death hurts, if they will suffer, suffocate, or die from extreme uncontrolled pain. But they stop mid-sentence and tell themselves that death is still a long way off, that they mustn't worry themselves with these questions right now. You imagine that each of them wears a necklace of intricate, intersecting circles of loss, grief, anger, fear, sadness, regret. You visualize this necklace hanging at their throats, golden and glistening under the hospital's fluorescent lights in the moments when their expressions of emotion make you wanna leave the room. This is a necklace that you choose to wear too. Medicine has a language problem and we have a presence problem. When I was in my training, I routinely asked people leading questions. If your heart stops, would you like me to try to restart it with CPR? I told people that their loved one was stable or improving without having told them what constituted improvement or that stability on three forms of life support simply means wobbling on the edge of life and death. The word better is one of the most elastic terms we use in medicine. When I teach how to have serious conversations with patients and families, I emphasize that if words are our tools, both they are both blunt and sharp, and we must know how to wield them and wield them carefully. Even when people are unprepared to have these talks, 
I'd always told myself that using the right language, the right words, being precise and straightforward, that honesty we can offer is the compassion that we can offer. In early 2020, believing these things, it wasn't yet clear what sort of invisible enemy COVID might be. And Los Angeles at the time had been spared New York's devastation. At work, we gasped at the images from New York we saw on the news. And to cope with our fear, we laughed at the images here, ones that felt safer to take in than instead of facing our fear of what COVID might truly mean and how it might reconfigure our worlds and the worlds of people we love. It was easier to joke that a gynecologist might intubate someone or that Lionel Richie is holding a bunch of bath tissue that someone has hoarded. That was easier to think about than to prepare ourselves for the tidal wave that was about to hit. The hospital changed. It grew quiet and empty as visitors were no longer allowed. Where I might have previously seen patient, family at bedside or heard conversations between patients and family, I'd instead see signs like these in newly silent rooms, taped up by nurses who picked up these signs from a son or a wife or a fiance or friend who met them in the lobby of the hospital. I'd read these signs and be reminded of everybody who was shut out and who couldn't be let in. And I turned away quickly when the signs were in the handwriting of children. Soon enough, COVID showed up. During COVID, I wanted to ensure that all people sick enough to be particularly in the intensive care unit with COVID had the support of our palliative care team. And so we saw each patient who was admitted to the ICU and met with their families once, twice, sometimes three times a week along with the ICU teams to make sure that families were getting real-time updates about how their loved one was doing because it was only with those medical updates that we could ask them to give us information about what their loved one might want or not want for themselves in these circumstances. The waiting rooms in our hospital where we used to meet with family were locked. And so we began to speak with families by Zoom, each person now a face in a rectangle, often with a list of written questions, wondering if we had considered experimental therapies, why their loved one hadn't gotten convalescent plasma, how they knew another person survived COVID because of intravenous vitamin C and couldn't we do that too? I saw their suffering in a new way. As nurses in the ICU used iPads during these meetings, so we could show families how many machines and medications their loved one needed to survive. They were seeing our observations and our interpretations of what was going on instead of seeing with their own eyes and feeling with their own hands what their loved one was going through. People grew angry when someone worsened. Wouldn't he be better if I was allowed into the hospital? I can't be with him so he doesn't feel like he has anything to fight for. Even when early reports circulated about COVID, I had been hopeful that maybe this pandemic would have given people reason to take on some of the topics that we try to avoid very understandably about what we want for ourselves if we're really sick and what we would want for ourselves at the end of life. It was extremely disconnecting to have these conversations over Zoom in a way where I could not offer empathy in the way you can in person. I couldn't lay a hand on a grieving person's shoulder or offer people tissues, which was a profoundly strange way in, in which to engage with people who were making huge decisions. Not only was I disconnected from families, there was a time during the pandemic when only our ICU team was allowed into the ICU to see patients because of lack of PPE and a desire to really minimize the number of people who were exposed to people infected with COVID. And so there were times I had conversations across a Zoom screen 
never having actually laid eyes on a person I was talking about myself. During that time also, our own team was disconnected from each other because of social distancing. And so I might have been in my office alone and my social worker might have been joining the call from home and the family was on Zoom. And so the kind of experience of doing what I'd by then been doing for five years was fundamentally altered for people on both sides of the screen. And across the screen, we are all one dimensional. The reduction of our complexity felt metaphorical in a way during this pandemic. And one situation, a story that I wanted to tell you about in this presentation is about a person I'll call Dr. Mr. Jones. He'd worked in a grocery store as a clerk for decades and had just retired when he fell ill. He was rushed to the hospital when he suddenly started struggling to breathe and he burned with fever and dripped with sweat. I met his wife and sons over Zoom and they were still grieving, trying to come to terms with how in the world he could have gotten this sick when they had taken every possible precaution as had he. Our words and presence across a, a screen became more important than ever. If I had previously put all of my faith in the words I used and how I used them, when I couldn't even see somebody in person to tell them the words I'd carefully chosen, those things became even more important across a Zoom screen. Was I picking the words I meant? Was I making sure I was guiding them both to the bigger picture of what their loved one was facing while also communicating details? Was I pausing? Was I offering the right tone of voice? When you can't be with people together and you're showing them a loved one across the screen in the ICU, they have to put their trust in what we're saying. And the challenge of connection was real, as was the trauma of people seeing their loved one unconscious, on machines, on drips, unable to participate in any way and unable to respond to their voice. So this family was one I vividly remember who struggled with all of these issues all the, all the while they were grieving why their loved one got sick in the first place. I wanna talk about something I call the flawed script. Both healthcare workers and people living in the world have a lot of difficulty having conversations about the topics that COVID has brought to the forefront. I believe and what I've observed is that both healthcare workers or doctors specifically and patients and their families may wait for the other party to broach the subject and that this silence is a false reassurance that things are okay, that this conversation can happen later. This is why many a discussion might take place in an emergency or near emergency situation, usually when somebody is in the hospital. We physicians may fear scaring people if we begin a discussion at the time someone is diagnosed with a serious illness. People may hear that, the beginning of this conversation at the time of diagnosis as a sign of giving up or a sign of negativity when what they want most is to be positive. COVID raised the stakes and showed how flawed this sort of thinking is and how suffering of all parties involved may be worsened when we wait to have these talks. Some of the earliest reports out of New York were from emergency room doctors newly pushed to have these conversations when people were crashing before them. And in many instances, they too read from a script that many knew was not ideal, but they didn't have other words at the time and they certainly didn't have the time. That sort of moral distress over lacking the language and lacking the experience and training came to the forefront, not just in the emergency room, but in many other settings that physicians and other healthcare workers were caring for patients. This question that I asked 
innumerable times when I was in my training, if your heart stops and you stop breathing, would you want CPR and a ventilator? I wish I could go back to each of those situations and eat my words and try again because I wasn't the guide that I needed to be. And I also had no training on how to be a better guide. When these questions are asked without people considering beforehand, even once or twice, what they might want, what their answer might be, distress levels go up even further. And the default is to do everything possible in the absence of knowledge otherwise, which is of course very deeply human and something I observed even more during COVID than I'd expected to. Some of the things I heard during COVID were very similar to what I've heard in other contexts in my practice. My dad told me that he wants everything done to keep him alive. My wife is a fighter and she made it through a liver transplant so she can make it through this. Mom, do you want CPR or not? Would you wanna be on a ventilator? How do we extract meaning from words like fighter, being a fighter, wanting everything done and awaiting the miracle? When I heard these sorts of words in my training, the conversation stopped there. When families heard their loved ones say these words, conversations often stopped there. And what I've learned to do is to push deeper, to dig deeper, to know what those words mean to the person who's using them and what they might mean in the context, the specific context that is often missing when we're asking people these questions. Talking with anyone you love or with your doctors about goals, values, and preferences we can't ask in a vacuum, we must ask, act, ask in a context. So when Mr. Jones's daughter told me that he wanted everything done and wanted to live, and that the last thing he had said to her before he got intubated was that he wanted to be on a ventilator, I couldn't blame her. And I couldn't blame him for have talked about talking about these wishes in a rushed, context where the stakes were very high. But one of the things that we had to do was to kind of reframe the context in which we were now trying to consider what he might want for himself if our best efforts failed him. Or if even though he was a fighting spirit and fought hard as a person, his body might approach the limits of what it could handle under the distress of COVID. Things like, I want to be on life support for one week, and if no improvement, I'd like to stop. I've heard this said many times, especially over the last year, and I've certainly heard, I want everything done to live as long as possible. But what's actually going on at the time? Is this being talked about at the time of a new cancer diagnosis when someone is outside the hospital and well and able to kind of hear what's going on and make their own decisions? Or are we taking those statements when somebody is on a lot of life support in the ICU and then how do we return to those statements and try to reframe them or interpret them in the specific context somebody is living in? One of the things that I wanted to offer in this talk was not only to kind of look at language as a tool, but to give you some examples, especially when we're talking with our own loved ones, of how might we veer into this tricky territory. I think, number one, it's absolutely okay to acknowledge your own trepidation and to say that you're frightened to bring up this conversation because it's unimaginable to think about losing the person you love. One thing we might say, reading about COVID in the news has made me worried about you. It's made me think that we should probably have a game plan for what you'd want for yourself if you suddenly got that sick. Things can change so fast that I thought now might be a good time to talk about this when you're not sick and can think through what you want. None of us can plan for every possible situation you might encounter, but having an idea of what you generally want and what makes life worth living for you 
those big picture items can help me to be your voice when you can't speak for yourself. So being person focused rather than disease focused. When I think of you, gardening and riding motorcycles immediately come to mind. If you were sick, I would certainly wanna know whether life support would get you back to doing those things. What are your thoughts? So we're offering things that we see in the other person that bring them to life, that animate their lives, and then tying it to the situations they may come across. And COVID is a great excuse for starting these conversations. Asking who should be your spokesperson and who shouldn't. Who do you think should be your spokesperson? I worry that mom might be too close and it might be hard for her to be put in, put in the position of making calls about you, about what you want when she might be really tempted to do what she wants. Bringing in another experience with death to be part of this conversation in order to kind of give bring to mind for people what have they seen that they thought was a good death what have they seen as a death they wouldn't want to have? So you might ask, when grandma died, she was in the ICU for a long time. And I remember mom saying she would never want to go through that and die that way. What did you think about that experience? What came up for you when I just mentioned it now? And what would be important at life's end? So when you are dying, would it be important for you to be at home or in the hospital, assuming that we might even have that choice? The reason I added on that last piece at the very end of that question was that sometimes we may really want to be at home, but we do end up dying in the hospital. Sometimes we actually want to die in the hospital because it's a place where there's a lot more care and people can respond to emergencies quickly. And despite us wanting that, we die at home. So having the conversation and posing that question doesn't mean that our wishes will always be fulfilled, but that if we are in the position of choosing for a loved one, then we can act accordingly. We had two meetings the first two weeks that Mr. Jones was in the hospital. And I learned that aside from the brief conversation that he had had with his daughter before he got intubated, that they had never had a discussion about what he might want for himself. His wife told me that she never had to nag him to take his pills. He was on top of his diabetes. He was on top of his hypertension. He kept telling her his refrain, as she put it, was that I want to live well. And in the meetings, what we tried to do is to ask them more about him as a person. Tell me about his day-to-day -day life. What did he really enjoy doing? What are the sorts of abilities that are so critical to his life that his quality of life would be irreparably damaged if he couldn't do those things? And when we got to the time that he was no longer just needing a ventilator, but also needing a dialysis machine because his kidneys failed. What we had to do was take the fact of his kidneys failing and marry it to the significance of what it meant that his kidneys are failing. So not just saying it, but saying, now that he's struggling with two organ systems failing, you mentioned that riding his bicycle is one of the most important things to him in the world, that he hated cars, but he would ride his bike anywhere, even in Los Angeles, which is truly quite a feat, makes him somewhat of a daredevil. If he needs dialysis, his chances of coming out of the ICU fall dramatically. So I wanna to talk to you about what that means for him. Throughout this process, and it must be mentioned, one person from a palliative care team cannot do this work. We have a wonderful interdisciplinary team and palliative care done best is truly interdisciplinary. So our social worker was following all along providing psychosocial support. Our chaplain was involved because Mr. Jones and his family are deeply Catholic. 
and um, there were nurses involved to also provide support alongside our nurse practitioner. The other thing that we had to do was to learn to make recommendations. That when we are asking questions of loved ones and what they would want, when we're asking families about their loved one and what their loved one might say or might want, that we also have to give them recommendations that would make sense and talk about the things that may not further someone's stated goal, as hard as that might be to acknowledge. I also wanna talk about the questions to ask your doctor or other members of your medical team, either in the clinic setting or in the hospital. Because as much as it's important to have discussions among each other, one of the things that's so important is that medical recommendations and context matter, as I was saying earlier. We are not good sometimes at providing recommendations because so much of the way we have been trained is to ask patients, do you want us to do this? And then wait for them to decide. But in a way that's an abdication of our responsibility in part because we have to explain what options might make sense and what options might actually cause more harm than good. And that's something that I think is a work in progress in the medical profession, but it's something we're taking steps towards. And precisely because we tend to leave big decisions to patients and families, it sometimes takes you inviting your doctor to make recommendations or to give their thoughts to make your decisions the most informed they can be. So asking things like this, COVID has really scared me. I'd like your help in understanding the options that I might have if I get COVID and need life support. Can we talk about this? Another thing to think about, I know that I already have issues with COPD and heart failure. And my daughters asked me what I'd want if I got COVID. I honestly don't know if being on a ventilator would help me, would it hurt me? I have other things going on. Can we talk about all of this? And asking what sorts of documentation they may be able to provide you so that your wishes can be known to your family and to the medical teams. What are the sorts of forms or documents I should think about filling out so everybody taking care of me and everybody who loves me knows what I would want? And in the hospital, if you have a loved one in the hospital, asking, why is my loved one on these machines? Why does he need them? When you say he's getting better, can you tell me what you mean by that? What does getting better look like? And in your mind, what are the goals that you are hoping to achieve with this treatment plan? Are we looking at just trying to get him out of the ICU? Do we think that after he, if he comes out of the ICU that he could eventually leave the hospital? What sort of rehabilitation would we, we be looking at if he does get out of the hospital? What should we do if the plan doesn't work? What would that look like? And what are the sorts of things my family and I need to think about? One of the hardest parts of our conversations with Mr. Jones was that eventually it became very clear that his body was showing us that despite being on two machines to support his lungs and kidneys, and many medications to treat infections he'd acquired and to support his blood pressure, that he is dying, that he was dying. And so one of the hardest questions to ask people in person, let alone over Zoom, is what we should do next. If we believe that life support would prolong his death rather than bridge him back to a life he would want for himself. His family was pretty divided about this, significant distress between his spouse and his children and his siblings and his children. And so when we were all on Zoom calls together, one of the things that became so clear is how not having had these discussions, which again is very normal and very human, but the suffering for everybody on the other side of the screen was profound. <laughs> 
they all wanted to know in different ways, is he suffering? How do we know if he's suffering? You're saying that being on life support for a long time could cause suffering, but how do we know that? What does that look like? They wanted to be with him when he died. And we talked about the option of coming off life support when they were there to allow them to be there, to allow us to take good care of him in that transition. And because of the divisions, he died in the middle of the night alone. And when I followed up with his wife, she said that she said with regret that she didn't know what to do. She didn't know what her husband would really want at this point, now that a try at ventilation and dialysis had been done. And so recognizing that what he might have wanted in the beginning when he just got sick, perhaps would have been very different at the point he was at when he died. There were others I met along in this journey with COVID who knew immediately what their loved ones would want, but still struggled to say the words. There was a gentleman who came in extremely sick, was on a ventilator, was proned, meaning he was in a different position. We manipulated the bed differently for us to be able to get as much of his lung as possible to acquire oxygen. And when we met with the family and the ICU physician said, I don't see him doing well. And the family pressed the physician and said, do you think he's going to make it out of the ICU? And the minute that the physician shared, no, I don't think he's gonna make it out of the ICU, they knew immediately that he would never want to live suspended in this way, not being able to live with machines or die without them. So because I am running up against the limits of the time given to me, I wanted you to just think about an exercise for inspiration. Visualize the person or people in your life who know you the very best and write down three sentences capturing what you would want them to know to take the best care of you if you couldn't speak for yourself. Think about relatives, friends, or other loved ones you've lost. Who had a good death? Who had a bad death? Why do you define one as a good death and one as a bad death? Then think about sitting with the person or one of the people you feel know you know best. Take a deep breath and come from a place of love. What are the questions you would want them to answer to enable you to be their voice? I wanted to read a passage about my conversation with my own parents, but because we're running out of time, I'll just let you know it's in the book and I struggled terribly with having that conversation myself because I tried to be doctorly, but I was also a daughter. And we all wear those multiple roles. We all wear those multiple hats in different ways in our lives. And just so you know, you're not alone in thinking that these conversations are hard to start and hard to finish. Those of us who do this professionally struggle with it. There's someone in the audience today who's married to a writer that I greatly admire, and he gave her a card that's on their fridge, and it says, everything you want is on the other side of fear. And I wrote the following sentences a few days ago when I was thinking about this card. Ask the first question and pause. Answer and pause. It will be scary, even if it comes from a place of love, maybe especially when it comes from a place of love. It will require you to be clear-eyed and open-hearted. You don't have to be perfect. The talk doesn't have to be linear. Bring all of yourselves, the scared one, the angry one, the one who is full of love and joy, the one who never wants to let your loved one go. Listen deeply and love radically. Or put differently in the words of a writer I admire very much, let yourself be gutted, let it open you, start there. I really do believe that moving towards the difficulty of having these conversations is a way to deeply honor the people around us and engaging the people who know them medically is a way for these conversations to be the most informed and well-rounded. And I hope that some of the language I've given you tonight can be helpful.
This is a picture of me and my parents around Thanksgiving time and my dog, Ruhi. Um, I had those conversations with them, even though it nearly broke me in many different ways. And so we're all still standing. We were all alive and kicking at the time of Thanksgiving and still are. So there is life and hope on the other side of these talks. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sunita, for sharing uh, your powerful, intimate journey as a physician and as a person, and for sharing your heart. We're deeply, deeply grateful. And I now have the pleasure to introduce uh, two amazing members uh, of our community who will be on a brief panel conversation with Dr. Sunita. And the first person is Lois Capps, who um, was a respected leader for 18 years in the US House of Representatives of Congress before retiring in 2017. She is currently on the board of directors of Hospice of Santa Barbara. Welcome Lois. And Reverend Julia Hamilton, who is the lead minister at the Unitarian Society of Santa Barbara. Welcome, Julia, Reverend Julia. And I'll pass it now to you, Reverend Julia. Take it away and thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, David. And thank you, Dr. Puri, for um, cracking open your heart and sharing with us um, your experiences during this remarkable year um, and everything that we have all gone through collectively as a community, um, and especially the insight that you bring from your perspective um, in the hospital with uh, people during this hardest of times. And um, thank you, Lois, for chiming in. And the chat is now open, so if you would like to uh, chime in on the chat, go ahead. But um, I thought I'd just start us off by asking one of the most iconic images is that image of the iPad in the ICU. And you talked about the challenge of connecting with somebody who you had never been in the room with, connecting with family members you'd never met. And yet also I get the feeling that telemedicine is here to stay. Yes. Um, that this is something we're gonna have to get increasingly used to. And it brings some gifts as well as some real challenges. And wondering if you have any um, insight about how we can most effectively communicate with our care providers, our doctors on the iPad. What can we do? What have you seen that works um, to help make that as best as it can be? Great question. So I do agree with you. Telemedicine is here to stay for better or worse. Um, I think when you're talking to your doctor across an iPad, I would think of it, I, I encourage you to think of it as if the iPad isn't there. Because if you're able to communicate your wishes and ask your doctor some of the questions that are on your mind and ask you know, for you to be able to share your perspective on what's going on in, in the conversation or in your life situation, I think that that is actually really great to be able to do on an iPad, especially let's say you're on the appointment on behalf of someone you love who's really, really, really sick. I do a lot of my own palliative care clinic visits via telemedicine because so many of my patients are homebound or they're too sick to come into clinic or they're in too much pain to move. And so telemedicine can be a surprising gift. I think in my field, something is greatly lost over telemedicine and I do try my best to see people in person. But thinking back to the people who dragged themselves into clinics suffering just to see me, I do think this is a gift. And I think asking of our doctors what we want is something that requires foresight. And so I always tell people before you go into a doctor's appointment, whether it's just a primary care checkup or a palliative care appointment, write down what you want to talk to your doctor about or the priorities for that meeting because sometimes we might have an hour, but sometimes we'll have 20 minutes. And so the more efficient you can use your time by referring to questions and your own goals from the clinic appointment, the better. Thank you, Reverend Julia. And Dr. Puri, I was overcome uh, as you were describing COVID, but I don't, and I realize what a year all of us have been through. Yeah. Uh, whether personally, in that hospital setting or knowing someone, or even if just now having lived through it, uh, it brings us up short. 
on, on our lack of um, abilities for many of us on how to approach this. And you were so powerful with your words describing, uh, describing this person that, that you were caring for. And some of us are thinking of end of life issues and importance of of uh, having an opportunity to make a decision what we would like uh, if we are in that setting. It's not easy to do, uh, but I, I have done it. I advise it for anyone uh, to start. It can be modified as time goes on, but have something in writing if you can. And also um, the importance that you talked about words healing and we are self-conscious in talking about how we are facing death, facing yeah. our mortality, and facing the mortality of a loved one. But just beginning the conversation is important. Once you start, as you so beautifully illustrated, the words can come, and and they can be awkward to start with. It's the convert, it's the saying of them. It's the accompanying another in this process of yeah. grief and that grieving is love. So thank you so much. I know we have many questions. We won't get to them. I'm wondering, um, you spoke at the end particularly about sort of acting out of fear versus acting out of love. Yes. Right. And, and how to discern when the questions and the actions we're taking are moving, are coming from that fearful place. And when they're coming from that compassionate place. And I'm wondering how do you help move people when you see people kind of coming from that fearful place? Do you have any ways that you help shift towards that more compassionate, um, loving ground? I think being with the fear and acknowledging it is huge, right? Because it would be very easy for me to say, okay, this person's scared or think about it. The family's not ready. They're scared. I'm just going to give them time. I think the harder thing to do is to acknowledge that I can sense you're really scared. And I want to tell you that that's completely normal. Can we talk about what you're afraid of? And a great, that someone who trained me in my, in medical school, a psychiatrist said something I'll never forget, which is move towards the difficulty. Don't retreat from it. And I think if we have the courage to acknowledge someone's in a hard place, but I'm willing to be with them in the hard place, maybe they'll be willing to tell me about the hard place. And it's with that understanding that we might move from fear to something much more powerful than fear. Um, I also think sometimes I say to patients, especially those I've known for a long time, I'm afraid to have this conversation with you because I care about you, but it's because I care about you that I have to have this conversation. And so I think it's the naming of it and being with it and being willing to be with it that I think is the hard thing to do. It's so much easier to say, they're scared I'm gonna leave, but nothing's gonna change then. It's not gonna to move towards an understanding of what someone would really want for themselves. It's gonna stay stagnant. And then it will fall on families who don't know what their loved one wants, who have no idea. And that's a really hard place for families to be. So it's out of love for everybody involved and with compassion for the severity of the situation that we should be with fear and find our way to bear fear. One of our listeners knew of this, uh, just mentioned the word transparency and how important that is. And I believe uh, she's onto something by saying that when we are transparent, when we acknowledge fears, that we are um, making ourselves vulnerable in the way that shows our compassion. Yeah. That that ties into another comment that asked about sort of the, the specificity of words, naming death and dying and not using euphemisms or speaking in generalities and wondering how you navigate. Uh, you know, as a minister, a lot of times I reflect back the language that other people use, right? I try to 
use language that um, resonates with their tradition or their uh, family. But it, but at the same time, you have to know when to push on it a little bit and and name specifically um, the death that's in the room. And okay. wondering if you know what your feelings are about how do you decide when to push and when to make space. So yeah, I you know one thing I wrote about in the book was kind of being an accidental linguist. Because as I mentioned earlier, we use words like improvement and better, and people use words like miracle and fighter and every do everything. But what do those words actually mean? And I think that excavation of meaning is the art of being in these conversations. So a lot of times when I was in my training, someone said, well, I'm waiting for a miracle. And I was like, okay, I guess that means I should put them through everything I have to offer. What I do now and what I've learned the hard way is to say, tell me what that means to you. Yeah. What does a miracle look like to you? What should we do if the miracle you're hoping for doesn't come to pass, even though we all hope it will? When you say you want me to do everything for your loved one, tell me what you're envisioning. And what if we do everything and he is still dying? Can we talk about a plan B? If you say you're a fighter, tell me what that means to you. Tell me about the ways you fought in your life. And can we think about what it might mean if you're a fighter, but your body can't fight anymore? And so trying to really understand what do the words mean and potentially what are they standing in for? What is everything else that those words have come to mean in a larger cultural sense? And we assume that's what they mean when everyone uses them, but that's not always what they mean. Somebody once wanted a miracle of just getting her husband home out of the ICU. Sometimes a miracle is just that he won't die in pain. And so unless we ask why people are using those words, we can never really be in an honest conversation with them. We use a lot of euphemisms in medicine. We say things like, your loved one will pass, we say, he's doing okay, he's stable, right? None of that means anything. What does it mean that someone's stable if I'm doing the work of four organ systems for them? Is that stable? And I think if we get rid of all of that and instead of using words that are elastic enough to allow for false hope and instead use words that are direct, because I really believe that directness is the compassion, even when it's hard to say, your loved one is dying. This is what this means. This is why I'm saying that. Did he talk to you about what he would want for himself when he's dying? Does spirituality mean something to him with disease now or towards the end? And I think it's our using precise language that will perhaps force more precise language to those who are listening to us. And the double challenge for many is that we grow up, we're living in a culture where we don't talk about this all through life. Mm -hmm. Really is a part of living. And yet we wait until these traumatic and life-threatening yeah. moments come. And then we realize all that fear, but I could just, just saying that out loud sort of opens up a door perhaps that, and, and then gives us, this conversation gives me the realization that these are conversations to have every day, not every single day, but enough that they become comfortable. And I think the, the context in which we experience discomfort is also a larger cultural issue that I hope we can work towards shifting because I didn't grow up in a death fearing household. I grew up in a spiritual tradition where from birth, you learn that death is inevitable, that change is the only constant in life, that the more you hang on to what is impermanent, the more you will cause your own suffering. And these are things that I can say aloud, but they're hard to follow. But I imagine growing up in a home where death or change or impermanence was never acknowledged. And I think that is a bigger barrier to having these sorts of discussions. And so I think the more, I almost think of the conversations we have with our loved ones as a mini revolution 
that can we change that culture one conversation at a time? I believe it's possible, but I also believe that we need to offer people examples of the language that they can use to do that. I think we have time for maybe one more train of thought uh, this evening before we have to wrap it up. And I'm, I'm wondering, you talked about a culture shift if, if you could see us coming out of this pandemic time and making one huge change in our culture around this topic or change in the way um, people are trained, medical professionals and other caregivers are trained, what would you hope sticks? What would you hope we carry out of this? I think in terms of a cultural change in, in medicine and the health professions that we need to be trained in this, like this needs to be part of our curricula from day one of our professional training, that leaving this to residents floundering with no experience, no good teachers, that is a crime. It's a crime for the residents. It's a crime for everybody who's taking care of them. So I think just as we have standardized curricula for cardiology or oncology, we need standardized curricula for how to talk about people who have cardiac or oncologic issues. I think in the general, in general society, that cultural change is going to take a very long time. It's going to take even interrogation within oneself, right? And I would encourage, I really do believe big change happens on the unit of one person. So if you go home tonight and ask yourselves about the questions I posed, what are the things you would want someone to know about you if they were making decisions on your behalf? What are the things you want them to tell you so that you can make decisions on their behalf? I think that's a mini revolution to sit there and ask yourself, if I say these phrases or questions aloud, what's coming up for me? What's the block? And if I think about my own mortality, what comes up? What am I scared of? What am I hoping for? What would I absolutely not want? And it's maybe in just the acknowledging that I too am of the nature to die, like the Buddha has said, that sometimes I think the unit of change can happen there, that I can look myself in the eye in a mirror and say, I'm going to die one day. The things around me are going to change. What will not change? Who am I really? What is permanent in this life or about me and what is fleeting? And that might be the tiniest and most important unit of change is the conversation we have with ourselves. Thank you so much. Uh, we could, I, you know, wish we had all evening, but I'm going to turn it back over to David to close us up this evening. I too wish we had more time. This has been such a powerful uh, hour of conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sunita Puri. And thank you, Lois Caps, And thank you, Reverend Julia Hamilton. Uh, we're so deeply grateful to have you all this evening. And to everyone watching, we're so pleased to be able to offer this Illuminate series for free, but we cannot do it without your help, as I've shared in our past uh, events on this series. So please consider a donation to ensure the future of this series by using one of the methods shown on the screen here. And also please visit our website shown here as well, to sign up for our upcoming Illuminate series events, freely offered to everyone, but pre-registration is required ahead of time. So thank you everyone for being with us this evening and have a good rest of your day and evening. Mm -hmm.